We're here on the New Mexico-Texas border. Scientists call this the Mescalera Sands area. If you're a botanist, you would call this the Shinnery Oak habitat. But we're here at the home of the one of the most critically endangered and habitat-specific lizards in the United States, the sagebrush lizard. We're starting to get a little hot out here. I'm gonna change hats. You gotta protect all you can out here in this hot desert. Now this oak tree behind me is actually a tree and it produces these amazing little acorns that are really cool and these provide food for javelina, scaled quail and a lot of the other animals that call this shinnery oak habitat their home. And this little tree or shrub depending on what botanist you talk to only grows to be about 30 inches tall and the amazing thing about this little habitat is these acorns, as dry as it is, never get a chance to germinate. So what this plant does is it sends out these shooters all around and it clones itself. And this one tree, all this you see behind me, is exactly one tree. And it probably spreads for acres and acres. So it's a marvelous little way of sustaining life. 95% of this tree is found underground. And what you're seeing are just these little shooters and these little risers that come up to be little oak trees and produce these acorns. So it's an amazing habitat. The other cool thing about this habitat is every one of these trees has its own bacteria growing in the sand. So if you go way back in here and you find a different shittery oak, it's gonna have a different type of bacteria. So this is a very dry, very harsh environment, but this is where our little sagebrush lizard lives. The dune sagebrush lizard is small by lizard standards. Now an adult usually averages between four and five inches in length. Now they look rather dull, but this tan coloration helps them to survive in this sandy environment that they call home. Now this lizard lives in a very small section of New Mexico and adjacent Texas. This lizard has the second most restricted range of any native lizard here in the United States. Now given this very restrictive range and pressures on their habitat and the uncertain look on their future, these lizards are listed as endangered by the state of New Mexico. Now many scientists believe it's just a matter of time before the species completely goes extinct. But why? And what can we do about this situation? Now to understand this, you need to understand the complexity of this ecosystem and the industry as a whole. Now the Mescalero Sands is an important feature in a larger system that we call the Permian Basin. Now, the Permian Basin gets its name from thick sedimentary rock deposits that were laid down during the Permian era over 250 million years ago. Now, these are considered some of the thickest rock deposits on the planet. The basin holds a vast amount of potassium that is mined to create salt. But it's not so much the salt mining that's become an issue, it's oil. Lots and lots of oil. Now below these sands and locked up in this dense rock lies one of the richest oil deposits in the world. This is considered the largest inshore deposit of oil anywhere here in the United States. Along with this there is a bountiful supply of natural gas. This is another major energy need. This is where our dilemma begins. The United States is the world's second largest consumer of energy. At least 25% of this comes from fossil fuels like oil and gas. Regardless of how a person feels about oil and gas, it's a way of life. It's what we use to power our machines, build our roads, heat our homes, create plastics from water bottles to life-saving surgical equipment. Virtually everything and everyone is somehow tied to gas and oil production. While over the decades, gas and oil drilling and refining has become much more ecologically friendly, there is still one aspect we cannot get around, and that's space. It takes a lot of room to explore and drill for these products, space that is many times already occupied. Now, as many species evolve, they become what we call a habitat specialist. Now, habitat specialists become so fine-tuned with this environment they cannot live anywhere else on the planet. Now this is the case of our little sagebrush lizard. We see these little wind carved places. We call them blowouts here. And this is where the sand dunes lizard live. This little microcosm, little microhabitat, is perfectly suited for our little sagebrush lizard. Within these blowouts, a tiny lizard eats out of moderate living. Being a habitat specialist, the sagebrush lizard, unlike most lizards, can't afford to be overly territorial. The territory of these males usually overlaps and they're quite tolerant of each other with the exception of breeding season. Now this is when combats between males can be pretty common. 
But by being easy going, this allows for gene flow between the small blowout habitats that dot this landscape. Occasionally, lizards may move from one blowout to the other through these corridors provided by the safety of the shinnery oak. This web of vegetative cover that connects these habitats has allowed these lizards to persist and stay genetically strong over time. So let's take a look at where the problem lies. With such critical habitat above and rich deposits of gas and oil underneath, we have a conflict of vital interest. Now with these rich deposits of gas and oil underground and the habitat above, you would think, now what's the big deal? It's gonna be pretty easy. Take all the oil out from underground, leave the habitat above. Unfortunately, this has not been the case. So from 1989 to 1999, little sagebrush lizard and other animals that depend on the shinnery habitat have lost over 25% of their natural habitat. Now as these blowouts become cut off and isolated, the flow of genetics and viable breeding adults is gone. Now for an animal with a lifespan of just two to three years, it doesn't take long for these populations to crash and disappear altogether. The biologists have estimated that the maximum number of pump jacks per square mile should be no more than 13. That seems to be the upper limit that populations of these lizards can tolerate. Now, in many places, we see as much as 50 of these pumps operating in one square mile. Now, we see pollution and waste as a common feature in many of these drilling zones. Oil seepage, debris, roads, and pads that are built and then abandoned. Toxic gases that permeate from the ground and then settle at the surface where not just the lizards, but many other of these endemic species live. Another issue that's threatened the delicate shinnery oak habitat is by alteration of critical habitat for land used by ranchers. Now one of the methods that was formerly used is to spray herbicide that killed off the shinnery oak and opened up land for this cattle. Now the removal of the shinnery oak has destabilized the dunes and caused the loss of habitat for the lizard and reduction of this historical range is never a good thing. Now the Bureau of Land Management's Resource Management Plan Amendment and the CCA and the CCAA restrict shinnery oak treatments and protect the lizard's habitat. Now how do we find that balance between our energy needs and the protection of species threatened with extinction? In a landmark decision by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, it was decided not to list a lizard on the federally endangered species list. Rather, the conservation of this lizard was placed into a Candidate Conservation Agreement, or the CCA, or the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances, the CCAA. Now, the CCA will facilitate the voluntary cooperation of oil and gas industry, livestock producers, and other interested stakeholders, thereby providing conservation benefits to the dune lizard and others. When fully implemented, the CCA will provide guidance for conservation and management of the habitat by reducing or eliminating threats to the species. These agreements buffer the lizard's habitat and place oil and gas and other infrastructure outside of the shinnery dunes. Now, the majority of this lizard's range is enrolled into these programs. Scientists have found that energy companies can, in fact, drill and pump oil and gas from these areas with less impact on the habitat by drilling at an angle or so-called slant rig drilling or even horizontal directional drilling, critical areas such as these blowouts can be left untouched. In other words, take all the oil you want, just leave the habitat intact. Through the Canada Conservation Agreement, a compromising approach is being taken in order to balance our needs with those of species that rely on this habitat. As pumps are no longer productive, they are now being removed and harvested for parts or simply rebuilt at another productive site. The caliche pads are removed and recycled to repair roads that take their own toll on company vehicles, again reducing costs when it is all said and done. This not only allows the habitat a chance to heal itself, it acts as a means to balance the bottom line while preserving critical habitat. It just makes sense. There is a positive dialogue that is now emerging and looking at how both sides can work together and preserve this critical lizard habitat. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Our need for oil, gas, ranching, and others is always going to be present and even increasing. The need for preserving habitat for the sagebrush lizard and other species will always be an ever-increasing concern for all of us. So now we're going to have to learn to work smarter, not harder. The term conservation is defined in part by the wise use of our resources, not the overuse and certainly not no use at all. Everyone can play a vital role in the conservation of the sagebrush lizard and all species. 
Visit OurActionsMatter.org to learn what you and your family can do that will have a direct impact on our environment. Support the push for clean energy, such as wind and solar, as a way to meet our energy needs. Continue to support your Albuquerque Biopark and their conservation efforts. Learn more about the efforts and the progress of the Center of Excellence for Hazardous Materials Management, or the CEHMM. Now visit the websites of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to better understand what's going on in your area as well as across the nation. And most importantly, learn all you can about these incredible ecosystems around you. And not only learn to care, but share, because the application of knowledge is power.